Um, good afternoon or good evening rather. You're very welcome to our 2021 Young Professional Network Christmas special. Uh, this evening we're delighted to be joined by a panel of experts and commentators who are going to get stuck into some of the key political developments that have occurred over the last 12 months. Uh, my name is Dara Moriarty and I chair our YPN and I work in communications at the IAA. Um, in normal circumstances the Christmas YPN is essentially you know a second office party for us at the IAA. IAA staff under the age of 35 um, only the age of 35 because we are primarily an ageist uh, endeavour at the at the YPN uh, would, 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 would come along, they would wear their Christmas jumpers, they would have mince pies, they would eat Pringles, they'd have a few bottles of beer, glasses of wine, um, there'd be soft drinks for the non-drinkers, but unfortunately for the, the second year in a row we're doing things virtually, so it's not going to be as much crack, but we're going to do our best to have a bit of crack, even though 2021 hasn't been a very fun-filled year. <laughs> um, absolutely delighted this evening to be joined by Shona Murray, uh, Connor O'Neill and Aidan Regan. I'm going to formally introduce them in a moment, um, but before I do so, I just want to quickly run through some of the, the format issues and some of the housekeeping um, issues, which I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with at this point. Um, we're going to cover a range of topics. I have a couple of questions that I'm just going to put to each panellist. Uh, we will chop and change and jump around different topics just because the nature of the panel is a review of the year. Uh, please get your questions in. You can do so via the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and you can, of course, join the discussion on Twitter as well using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag YPN. Um, the full discussion is on the record and it's going to go up on our YouTube channel and our podcast platform straight afterwards. Um, and, and yeah, just please, please get stuck in, ask your questions um, and, and, and enjoy the discussion. Let me turn to our speakers who are formally introduced now. Uh, Shona Murray is Europe correspondent with Euronews. She's previously political correspondent with the Irish Independent and foreign affairs correspondent with News Talk. Uh, she has specialised in Brexit, has reported from dozens of countries around the world, uh, such as Israel and Gaza, Iraq, Turkey, Syria border, Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo South Sudan, Haiti and Guantanamo Bay. She holds an MPhil in International Peace and an LLM in International Law from Trinity College. She's an alum of the US State Department's Edward R. Murrow Programme for Journalists. Um, Conor O'Neill is Head of Policy and Advocacy with Christian Aid Ireland, an international aid and development NGO based in Dublin and Belfast. He leads the organization's work on climate change and economic justice, focusing on the issue of human rights, corporate accountability, tax avoidance and inequality between the global north and south. He previously worked as a researcher and advisor in the Oireachtas, in the EU institutions and with the human rights NGO based in Brussels. He has a BA and MSc in politics from Trinity College Dublin. And uh, last is Aidan Regan, Associate Professor at the School of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin and a columnist with the Business Post. He's director of UCD's Jamini Centre of Excellence in the New Political Economy of Europe and director of graduate master studies at the School of Politics. Aidan completed his PhD in public policy at the College of Social Science at UCD, while also working at the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Labour Studies at the University of Amsterdam. So we're actually delighted this evening to be joined by a very distinguished panel. Um, I'm going to just jump straight in with questions and Joan, I'll come to you first. You've just been telling us about how busy your day is with the European Council taking place uh, tomorrow on Friday. Um, and I do want to talk to you initially just about German politics and about the impact that, you know, Chancellor Merkel's tenure coming to an end is going to have on the EU. You know, you've, you've covered um, the European Union for a very long time and, and you're very familiar with the impact she's had over 16 years in office. Olaf Scholz became the Chancellor on the 8th of December. Um, how do you think his, his impact is going to be felt in the Council tomorrow? And, 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 and what will a post-Merkel EU look like? Sean, well, over to you. I think the hope is that it'll be very similar with Olaf Scholz because um, Angela Merkel was really seen to be quite a rock and steadied the ship uh, between, you know, from crisis to crisis that the EU has lurched from, whether it's the banking debt crisis, the refugee crisis, uh, COVID crisis. So I think everyone would like to believe that he would be able to do something similar and possibly better because um, there's a hope that the EU has learned from its, its mistakes when it comes to austerity. We saw that recognition with the EU recovery fund, 750 billion euro last year. In particular, um, I think one of the things that is quite a negative part of Angela Merkel's legacy is the fact that she, uh, over the past 10, 12 years, has appeased people like Viktor Orban, the Law and Justice Party in Poland, um, Janusz Janza in Slovenia by not engaging properly and coming hard on those countries when they've breached rule of law, 
not just EU rule of law, EU principles, EU values, to the point now where Hungary is no longer regarded as a democracy. And that obviously has implications for the rest of the European Union, for all of us, for EU taxpayers' money, because there's very uh, reasonable charges of corruption against Viktor Orban. So I think uh, Angela Merkel's legacy is quite tarnished because of this, because she's never... um, she's never allowed the commission really she's never influenced the commission to take a hard line which it could have done in terms of the um the treaties against these countries so Olaf Scholz um is it is hoped will take a harder line but also because the, he's going to government with the greens who themselves have said there needs to be a stronger line in this regard so there's hope um from sort of a more leftist or center left perspective that he can uh, steer the eu back to its values and principles and not be so uh, i suppose in hock to maybe sort of you know uh, big big organizations or sort of the german car manufacturers and so on who have such a huge business in hungary wouldn't want to see it confrontation between all those sides so that's really the hope of Olaf Scholz uh, and uh, I mean he's been obviously he's been around a long time he's an establishment figure you know he's vice chancellor and so on so he's been there from the start of COVID so there won't be any changes in terms of uh, how COVID is dealt with and we've seen that um, the Germany is taking a much harder line against the unvaccinated as well so I think the hope is that he may be an improvement, but there's you have to I have to admit there's nobody been really like Angela Merkel, not just because she's a woman, but when we had Trump in office and it looked like um, global security was at, under threat and it still is, then Angela Merkel was a very important person to have. She wasn't threatened by Trump. In fact, he was threatened by her. And I think everybody was glad to have her around throughout that period. And then I also think, you know, her legacy around the refugee crisis historically will always be the right decision. I think that was a landmark decision and she should get a huge amount of kudos uh, and support for that. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Shona. Aidan, just picking up on, on some of the points that, that Shona raised there, do you, do you have any, any, any sense or anything to add on sort of maybe the economic impact that, that Chancellor Merkel has had on the European Union? You know, we think of the debt crisis, we think of the financial crisis. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Angela Merkel's legacy will be kind of viewed in different time periods. I think the... I don't think... Her approach to European fiscal and monetary policy, economic policy, 2008, 9, 10, in those kind of years will be viewed too favorably by historians. But at the same time, one has to acknowledge that at that point, Angela Merkel was primarily responding to domestic public opinion or a certain part of domestic German public opinion. So she was quite constrained um, by what you know, the, the right of her own political party wanted. She was constrained uh, by kind of the emergence of a more kind of Eurosceptic vote. The kind of, and of course, the AFD alternative for Deutschland emerged as that kind of anti-redistributive, no physical transfers, no indeed. So she was constrained in that sense. But then later on, of course, she showed that she can kind of go against the kind of reactionary right within her country by her position on, on the refugee crisis, etc. And I think progressives, you know, as Shona just said, will look favorably upon those years and what she did there. But I think, you know, there is a legacy of damage to the European Union in, in terms of its implementation of what pretty much everybody agrees at this stage were austerity policies that negatively affected economic growth, employment, cohesion, the list goes on. And we're still, we're still kind of living with the legacy of that picking up the pieces. That's not to say that Angela Merkel is anyway directly responsible for it, but the politics within the European Council, the par- politics within the Eurogroup, very, <clears throat> very much centered around <clears throat> Germany and the CDU. So I think, you know, perhaps <clears throat> from a politics, political stability perspective, people might be wanting Olaf Scholz to kind of continue in that stable vein, but maybe the EU needs a bit of disruption on the economic side. Maybe the EU needs a bit of disruption on the fiscal and monetary side. Maybe it needs a bit more of a progressive. So it'll be interesting to see whether he builds a, a new coalition, you know, with Macron or with Draghi or with Pedro Sanchez in France. It'll be interesting to see the new dynamics within the European Council because um, it's not the CDU anymore. And I think that is an important shift. And I think it it will, you know, have an impact uh, on, on the trajectory of fiscal policy. Although having said that, a lot depends on the finance ministry within Germany, and that's held by somebody who's more to the right of Angela Merkel. So who knows? It's interesting yeah. as well, just that what Aidan says there, like from the kind of development and human rights sector, I know there's a huge amount of focus 
um, and interest in <clears throat> what might change in terms of foreign policy, not just on the economic and financial side, but for a very, very long time, Germany and, and Merkel as chancellor have had such a huge influence, often a deciding influence in the council on big issues of foreign policy. We, for example, we've run um, programs um, in Israel and Palestine going back to the 40s. And that on the Middle East peace process, this is something that Germany has tended to take a really cautious and at times conservative line. That's blocked a lot of initiatives at EU level. Um, and like, like Shona said, on some issues on migration, for example, have pushed in one direction, but on other issues more recently around, say, vaccine justice, Germany, Germany again has been a big and vocal voice at EU level that's been really staunchly opposed to some of the measures that have been proposed there. So, uh, you know, you're hoping as well with the fact that the, the Greens are part of the coalition that maybe the, the common German line on some of those big foreign policy issues might have a bit more wiggle room or might shift, but we're going to have to see, I suppose. Yeah, I think yeah. I'd agree with both on, on both those points. You know, I think with the austerity measures and, uh, I, you know, Angela Merkel did push push against, remember at the time during the Greek, specifically the Greek debt crisis part in 2015, when there was calls for Greece to be taken out of the euro by her finance minister at the time. Um, she resisted that. And I think there has been acknowledgement about austerity, which is why Germany led um, the cause for the 750 billion euro uh, rescue fund, which Germany wasn't going to get much of. France obviously got a huge amount, but it was obviously going to go to uh, Italy and Spain. On the human rights issue, though, I think you'll be disappointed, Connor, because I think Germany will never, no German government in in the next sort of 10 years will publicly confront Israel in relation to the Palestinian territories. As much as they are, you know, even uh, Heiko Maas did move in some direction, um, a much more compassionate line but I think that Germany isn't ready for that right now um, historically and from a societal perspective I don't think they they will maybe they'll move in, in, in towards giving more aid to the Palestinians but I don't think that they will be defining an apartheid situation or anything like that yeah and, and Sean just to pick you up on a point we move off Germany then in a moment, but you went as far as to say, you know, her legacy was tarnished by by her relationship with with, with Hungary and on, on the rule of law issue. Um, you know, how, how do you see that? Do you see do you see a different approach coming from Schultz and from the new German government, or or? Well, that's or the hope. Expect? I mean, that's that's what you when you when you, you ask the Germans and particularly the Greens because they they they're going quite hard on this. And then remember the Green MEPs in the Parliament have been very strong, like the Daniel Freund and so on. They've been leading the charge. They're the ones who are pursuing the Commission. They're actually suing the Commission uh, for um, dereliction of duty for not taking a hard line uh, against Poland and Hungary over various issues around rule of law. And I think that what's happened is, you know, over 10, 12 years, I remember, I remember being at summits where Enda Kenny was the Taoiseach and the EPP was obviously so influential at the time. And, you know, asking, well, look, at the time I remember the door when he was starting these sort of reforms where he was criminalizing um, people for being homeless and, and, and so on. And I remember the indignance you know, as a journalist, like that Enda Kenny even responded to me with, as in, you know, well, Victor Orban, we, we've no business interfering in, in uh, domestic affairs, which is sometimes the line that member states take. And that's understandable to a certain point. But these are also the LGBT community and, the, and, and so on, the people who he's targeting in order to whip up fear. These are EU citizens. And they deserve protection under the treaties. And so this has continued because if Angela Merkel wanted to take a stronger line within the EPP, when Orban was there, this we wouldn't have maybe gotten to this point. But she she was constantly about appeasement. And, you know, similarly, we've had the watering down of the legislation, which aligns rule of law, abiding with the rule of law to getting cohesion funding and structural funding and money from the, the recovery fund. But in the last few months, we have seen also the commission taking a bit of a hard line and the parliament pushing for that. So we'll see what happens over the next few months. But it's not a sustainable situation when you look at the confrontation between Poland and the European Court of Justice and what's been happening in Hungary. It's, it's not good for any of us. Yeah, I think if I can jump in and just make a comment on that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think it is interesting. I think something that's often not kind of remarked upon or maybe not more publicly acknowledged is just how integrated Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, and various Visegrad states are into German supply chains. Mm. I mean, Hungary is to foreign investment in Germany what Ireland is to foreign investment in the United States of America. 
So there's a very close network of business relationships between key automobile manufacturers within Germany that have serious investments in Hungary. And, you know, even before the, 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 the last kind of Hungarian election, the, the German Chamber of Commerce within Hungary was very clear that they were leaning towards a Fidesz government. They, that's what they kind of would have preferred, because the economic policies that, that Fidesz and Orban pursues domestically are very much in their interest. I mean, he has cut the corporate tax rate to the lowest in the European Union. He has pursued various labor market reforms which are very much about investing in science, technology, and engineering, and develop that vocational training structure, which is beneficial, the type of skills, ultimately, that those companies need. So, you know, though a lot of the manufacturing of, of key global German companies today takes place in, in Visegrad. And, you know, that obviously, and as you can imagine, a lot of those business networks are also closely tied to the CDU and so on, particularly within Bavaria. So there's a lot there. Uh, there's a lot of quiet politics behind the scenes in Germany and Hungary. To what extent that can continue, as shown the same before it ultimately gets to the point whereby somebody says this just can't continue we might be at that point it may not be even in germany's kind of the business interest to begin to be associated with this anymore but you know you know i'm not so sure that a lot of corporate capitalism in germany is all that bothered whether it's a liberal or, or an Ill illiberal democracy to be honest which is why it's very interesting that you have now in chancellor that's in the s d group of course you know because at least when you're in sort of a sort of a center right pro business, uh, pro industry party uh, like the EPP, then it's sort of an expectation that you take that line that, again, is supportive of particularly the, uh, the car industry. But in the S&Ds, Olaf Scholz has a responsibility to uphold yeah. the values of a grouping like that and talk about, you know, I mean, because we've seen. Uh, as you mentioned, the labor forms, we've seen uh, the situation in Hungary where people who are getting, uh, where not really, ha they don't really have good supports or uh, a proper regulated labor market. We've seen protests around that. So this is a real challenge for Olaf Schultz, actually. And it is interesting to see the opposition getting organized in Hungary. I mean, the, the opposition only a couple of years ago was highly fragmented, but the new kind of coalition of the broad left seems to be getting its house in order, particularly in, in the key city. So that's perhaps domestically something to, to watch within Hungary, because if any change is going to come there, you know, it's going to come domestically. Come from within. Yeah, exactly. Um, conscious that it, well, we're 20 minutes in on question one, so I'll, I'll, I'll motor on. Uh, Connor. second question is to you, and it's on COP. And, um, you know, obviously you mentioned some of the work that, the, that your own organisation is doing in this area, um, and, and your own research interest is on climate justice. I mean, everyone saw, I think hopefully everyone saw the, the impassioned plea from, from former President Mary Robinson on the issue of climate justice at COP. Um, how would you assess sort of you know a couple of weeks on now from the the, the outcome of COP26? How would you assess what 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 the pledges that were made from a climate justice standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to be honest, being in in Glasgow for two weeks um, and talking to delegates and negotiators, particularly from uh, global south countries, um, it was a very frustrating and at times kind of depressing experience because you see in real time. The, the needs and the views of poor communities kind of being sidelined by bigger, more powerful states. And those calls echoed by the likes of Mary Robinson, by our organizations, by um, delegates themselves for, you know, fair and fast and ambitious, but equitable climate action um, kind of being kicked to the touch. In terms of an assessment, I mean, I think as well, it, it's hard to judge something like this in terms, like as a binary success or failure. You know, so I think you have to, you have to kind of be honest about what, what COP is. It is essentially an attempt to try and determine a global baseline. You know, so you get 200 countries who come together and um, the entire process is done by consensus. So anything that's agreed has to be agreed by everyone. So it kind of automatically, if you look at the system, it tends towards a lowest common denominator outcome. That's the baseline. This is the point that everybody from the most ambitious states to the most conservative, to the ones with the highest emissions profile to the lowest, all agree on and then you can you can consider then like is that baseline higher than it was before and arguably yes but at the same time is there still an enormous gap between that and where you need to be um definitely and the crucial thing i suppose from from my view and the reason we were there is that kind of global climate justice perspective is what's being agreed and how is it how is it shared out and the like what we what we see as a development organization is the just the sheer just how profoundly unequal climate change is you know you see you look at for example the flooding in south sudan at the moment and the the fact that 
many of the world's poorest communities who have a done least to cause the crisis who b have the least resources to adapt and protect themselves are being disproportionately impacted and what's happening in south sudan in terms of flooding you see flooding drought cyclones um is is occurring right across africa and then you consider the flip side is that the entire continent of africa um is responsible for less than four percent of historic carbon emissions or you can you can consider that geography but also the economics of it so the the poorest half of the world you know around three and a half billion people is responsible for one tenth of historic carbon emissions and that that sort of inequality is recognized in in the climate treaties it's recognized in what was agreed in in copenhagen 2009 in the paris climate agreement 2015 um and the the targets that have been set for rich high emitters like ireland to essentially you know get our emissions down quicker so to leave as much of the remaining carbon budget for those poorer countries but also crucially to provide them with financial support, which if you were watching the news coverage was the big hot ticket item for the whole two weeks. The targets haven't really been met. And a lot of the, the, the trickier, thornier questions of who's gonna pay what and how, how, how does the global North essentially repay its ecological debt to the people who are being disproportionately impacted? They were kicked to touch. And I, I was talking to a delegate there and he made the, the argument that, you know, imagine if you're, if your really wealthy neighbor um, set your house on fire. And in fact, in the process of doing it, he got richer. And then when you asked him to try and fix it, he kind of said, well, you know, I can maybe give you some advice or I can give you some of this change, or maybe I can give you a loan at a really good interest rate. You just wouldn't accept it. And that, that's, I think it, it was very hard to see that inequality playing out. The, the, the flip side, I suppose, the more positive part though, I'd say is um, for the entire week, so the whole delegates would be streaming into this venue in Glasgow. There was just reams and reams of people, primarily young people outside the venue, holding not just the negotiators to account, but also the big well-funded NGOs, the researchers, the journalists who were there. And this kind of global distributional aspect was first and foremost for all of them. So I, I think the, the limited progress is there and it's because of that sort of growing and vibrant climate movement. And I think even though the, the multilateral system kind of kicks in and it protects the interest of bigger powerful states that demand for for climate justice isn't going away and it'll be there in egypt in 11 months time for cop 27 it'll be there the following year and yeah our, our job i suppose is to push for it to be to listen to you know yeah 100 percent. aiden on, on, on climate financing you know i mean it's it seems to be the new the new issue that all the all the big corporations are jumping on um you know i mean i think there was, there was a quote from Lawrence tubiana who said Greenwashing is the new climate denial. Um, what's what's your own take on on that on that issue? Because we, we heard pledges of billions, and, and the yeah. developing world was saying we need trillions. Um, yeah. So w where do you see that going? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's loads of ways, different ways to describe this kind of green capital neoliberal neoliberal 2.0 type thing. I mean, the fundamental question here, of course, and you, you alluded to it, is who's going to finance the transition, right? And and that is the fundamental question here: who's going to put the capital in? And it's, I suppose in a sense, there's two ways to look at it. Either the state takes a very active role and has a coordinated fiscal monetary plan and allocates capital effectively to kind of big green renewable projects and leads the charge and basically issues public bonds to finance that transition and central banks themselves will have a very proactive role. That's a kind of green industrial policy. That's obviously not really where we're at, um, notwithstanding kind of some voices in that space and both in academia and in policy, really where we're at is kind of green capital and green finance. And it was very clear at COP in Glasgow that that's where the, 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 the train is moving. I mean, Mark Carney gave a very important speech, said there was 130 trillion available in global assets under management by global investors. And he's willing and they're willing to put up that 130 trillion to finance the transition. And then it, very quickly, people realize when you look under the numbers and well, what do global asset managers do? Well, they allocate capital to what's most profitable, not to what's, what's needed. And what's most profitable at the moment continues to be carbon intensive industry and carbon intensive. And there's all most of that money uh, that is said to be shipped, will be shifted into green energy is already bound up in carbon intensive projects. So why would some super rich asset manager suddenly turn around and tell his clients that, well, you're now going to get maybe a 1% return. We don't know, it's uncertain. So the kind of paradigm shift, I think that we're seeing at the moment 
in green finance is the hope is that the state will effectively de-risk the investments. They'll become the insurer. Basically, they'll give social insurance to private capital that they'll get good money out of this and they'll go ahead and do it and, and make the money. I mean, most depending on, on, the, on, the, on the studies you read, but it's estimated that about five trillion is needed globally on an annual basis. Uh, in, in, in investment to reach the, even the, 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 the humble targets or the lower end of those targets. So, I mean, where's that 5 trillion going to come from? Big question. So I'm less convinced that green finance is going to lead the way, primarily based on the evidence that to date, we know that these investors tend to pursue what's profitable, not what is necessary. And as Connor said, fundamentally, we're talking about a structural paradigm shift to reach net zero by 2050. And that requires a complete uh, rethinking in our mindsets about how to allocate capital in the economy. One thing as well that sticks out in what Aidan just said there is like we, we've done a bunch of research in collaboration with Trocra and other organizations on, you know, the, the limited amounts of climate finance, especially public climate finance coming from the global north to south, where it's been spent, what it goes on. And the, the reliance on private finance to try and top that up and meet the target has seen it flow in where we would see as, as the totally the wrong direction. So generally, this money is kind of split between um, mitigation efforts. So how do you get your emissions down to adaptation? So how do you kind of protect yourself? So building something like a seawall and then finally, in, in theory, is being pushed for to actually compensation for losses and damages that are felt in countries that have had contributed very little to the crisis. And overwhelmingly, private finance goes to the first one because you can generate a return on investment if you're a big hedge fund or whatever. Um, if, you, if you close down a coal plant and you build a renewable, a renewable energy, uh, wind turbines and stuff like this, it is possible to generate an investment there. And then, but the latter two, it's very, very hard to convince people and, and to invest their money in building a seawall in parts of sub-Saharan Africa to prevent people from flooding. Those sort of adaptation measures that are really urgently needed, if you're going to address the fairness and justice side of it, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to orientate so much private capital to what so, to something that is just going to be less profitable than so many other alternatives. And that I, I watched that Mark Carney speech. I was listening to it, and you could see the heads of the the G77 and and uh, lower income countries delegates just shaking, just knowing that it was just part of this sort of um, kind of Tory bluster yeah it was just pulling figures out of the air and lo and behold when you do the sums there's nothing really behind it so I I would hope that the of the two visions that Aidan talked about there at this like the state is going to have to take a lead on this not just to decarbonize um western European economies but to as I would see it repay the sort of ecological debt that we have to those countries that are feeling the impacts but have contributed comparatively so so little to historic CO2 emissions. Um, moving, thanks very much, lads, for, for, for insights on that. I think it's really, really fascinating. Uh, moving from climate justice to economic justice and, and, and corporate tax and global tax reform, Aidan, yourself, um, in last week's business post, I'd encourage anybody who's watching in or listening in to, to read the piece you wrote. It was really brilliant, fascinating, long reads, trying to get the bottom of how Ireland's corporate tax rate has jumped from $6 billion uh, in takings in 2015 to 14 billion in takings in 2021. Um, can you talk to us about this? Maybe give us a short version because the article was really, really extensive. Um, can you talk us through that and then just also reflect on the, the reforms that we're currently seeing through the OECD and, and how that might have any impact on these arrangements? So, Aidan, over to you. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, if you think the piece was, the, you should you'd see, should, you should see the longer research pro project that it's part of, you know. But the... Um, yeah, look, it's complicated. <laughs> and of course, that's one of the reasons why we don't talk about tax, because it is complicated. So I think the role of social science here is to kind of make visible the invisible and to decipher a lot of this to, to make it accessible to, for the public interest. I mean, it's fairly clear that, you know, with the ending of the double Irish tax structure, the tax avoidance, which is in place for 20 odd years, whereby effectively, you know, somebody mostly US companies with intellectual property in the pharma or the tech sector could register a company in Ireland, but for tax purposes, it was in the Bermudas or some other offshore uh, British jurisdiction. Um, and of course, under US law, it was an Irish company, but under Irish law, it was the Bermuda company. And this effectively allowed you know, companies to house their intellectual property in this Bermuda Irish structure and ultimately license the use of it then to say the Irish company, say Google Ireland, 
who would pay a large fee to use whatever intellectual property is, the algorithm, the right to advertise, such that they could effectively bring down uh, their taxable income to, to, to very low levels. And this structure you know, has been, was in place for a long time. Um, but when that came, to, of course, global pressure, European Union, also from the US, began to put, you know, say, look, we, we can't continue with this, this system anymore. It's allowing global companies to reduce their effective corporate tax rate to as low as 5% on foreign earnings. And we're talking here, keep in mind, about trillion dollar companies, you know. Um, and then the question always was, so this, the, the group, Pascal Donahue, Department of Finance, put an end to this in 20, sorry, it was Michael Newton at the time in 2015. What's going to happen next? That was always the big question. You put, you put this structure to an end, what's going to happen next? And Ireland basically gave these companies five years to plan their next step or plan the next strategy. So the question was, would these companies, you know, move their intellectual property to Singapore, to Delaware, you know, keep it in, or over to Ireland or to, to the Netherlands, etc. And it has gone in different directions. But clearly, if you look at the data, you look at the CSO data on a net capital stock, you look at some of the data that I use on company registrations. I mean, there is now, according to the estimates and work I've done, about like conservatively about 400 billion in intellectual property has been onshore to the island of Ireland. And at the same time, the corporate tax rate has just been going up and up. And the, the correlation is very clear. So clearly, there's a strong correlation between the onshoring of the intellectual property by the pharma and tech companies and the kind of boom in the corporate tax receipts. What's not so clear is the mechanism that ties all that together. Um, and there's different views on this because on the one hand, you know, for example, Alphabet, Google, they haven't done it. They've shifted their intellectual property to Delaware, right? Worth knowing that Delaware doesn't tax from income that comes from intangible capital. That's what, so, so Delaware has emerging as the, the global tax haven, if you like. And interestingly, Delaware is the state that Joe Biden represented for 35 years. So, I mean, so, so but, but that is because they, they're booming in profits, right? And they've had to come up with some sort of cost sharing arrangement with their Irish subsidiaries. So, for example, Google paid 600 uh, million in tax to the Irish state last year. That's quite significant. Some of these companies, again, it's not revealed because it's it, are paying almost up to a billion, right? 900 million in some cases. So, there's it, either the profits that are being declared in Ireland have simply gone up with the onshoring of this capital or there's other stuff going on, but it's a very clear correlation. So the ending of the double Irish structure has led to this onshoring of capital. But the core point I think here is it's very volatile. So it's gone from 6 billion to 14 billion and Ireland is reaping the rewards of this, what I've called Treasure Ireland in that article, uh, clearly. But what will happen next, we don't know because you know the, the, the scheme ultimately is shift your intellectual property here, will give you the incentive is you don't pay tax or you can issue a loan to yourself to buy your own intellectual property, house it here for a certain amount of time, and we won't tax the income that emerges from it. Then that change the bid, it's going to be 80% or 100%, so it's quite complex. At some stage, it may be the case that these companies just decide, you know what, it's not really in our interest to keep it in Ireland anymore, because what is intellectual property? It's something, it's not a factory, it's not something that, that you know, it's literally, it could be somebody's pen drive, it could be an email. It could be just simply a concept. It's, it's a contract, effectively. It's a legally constituted contract that says you have the license to use that. So it's completely intangible. So you can flick a switch and send it over to Delaware, right? Um, so I think that the, the volatility really is, is a problem for Ireland. But at the same, you know, from a purely self-interested perspective, and if these companies are acting rationally, they're shifting profit, they're protecting their profits, you know, they want to kind of reduce taxable income. And Ireland is kind of carving off a, a decent slice of that pie for itself. But, and this is your, your, the subsequent part of your question, other countries aren't happy about that. And that's why, they, you know, we have, the, the speed with which Joe Biden pushed that to the top of the agenda in the OECD, the speed to which we ended up with the 15% minimum global corporate tax rate, which I think is a bit of a sideshow really, because the next step is what matters. What are the taxing rights? Who's going to decide what's taxable? Where's the intellectual property? Where's the labor? Where's the sales? Because we're talking here about digital markets that don't have physical jurisdictions. And this is the complexity today. So yeah, I mean, what's, who knows what's going to happen next? But I think um, this focus on the headline rate is, is just a bit of noise. It's really the deeper issue. And I think already these companies are 10 years ahead of, of where the politicians and, uh, are at, to be honest. I think they've already concocted the next scheme. Ten years ahead. Ten years ahead. Shona, can I just bring you in because you've been following European politics for a while, um, and and Pascal Dunne, who obviously has that role as president of the Eurogroup now. Just politically speaking, how do you think Ireland played its hand here, if if, if you could call it that, if it could be so crude? Because, you know, obviously the pressure, as Aidan has mentioned, came on from the Biden administration. You know, Trump tried it, but just wasn't as organised as Biden, and, and Biden, you know, has really 
shot this at the top of the OECD agenda. We saw the charm offensive by, you know, Secretary Yellen was in Ireland meeting Pascal, etc. There was back and forth and all of a sudden Ireland, you know, got its concession, not at least 15, 15 percent. Um, how, how do you think, you know, the Irish government played its hand here? On mute, Fiona. Sorry. We know that Ireland has obviously been under huge pressure uh, in relation to corporate tax for some time. Obviously, we had the CCCTV, cons Consolidated Corporate Tax Rate, our base, and that didn't get anywhere. Ireland is always saying that it's, you know, constructively engaging. It obviously got those guarantees around the Lisbon Treaty. And, you know, there's a feeling in Brussels that the Irish government um, has a sort of emotional, uh, and the Irish people actually has an emotional attachment to the 12.5% corporate tax rate because, and that's, so, that's rather an interesting thing. Every time you speak to journalists or even politicians around here, they, they, they would assume that the Irish government is pursuing, you know, retaining 12.5% and, you know, other loopholes because the Irish people wanted it because they saw it as the harbinger or the catalyst to having the Celtic tiger and so on. And so then there was a, there has been obviously a consensus that Ireland couldn't, it wasn't sustainable that Ireland could keep, continue to resist this. And obviously Secretary Ellen had been, had many conversations with Pascal Donoghue behind closed doors here in Brussels. And she went to Dublin as well. And um, I think there's a feeling that Ireland was sort of brought kicking and screaming, but at the same time, I mean, everybody understands that every country has their own, I suppose, comparative advantage. And this was Ireland's. And Ireland has made a strong case about geographing, geographically located elsewhere. And, and I think that eventually, you know, I think that when you look at the debate around the Pascal Donahue becoming president of the Eurogroup, um, you had the southern countries, uh, Greece, Spain and so on, and others really resisting his presidency because they felt this is going to be, as they did, they, as it was dubbed, the Google presidency of the Eurogroup, because he would be pro multinationals rather than trying to pursue uh, what was being prepared at the OECD and a much more fairer uh, tax system. Um, so I think there was, they were glad that Ireland gave in in the end. But um, again, as Aidan said, nobody's, I don't think anybody really feels that 12.5% to 15% means that multinationals are going to somehow pay fair tax or that uh, countries like France, for example, were doing it in that regard for that reason alone. They obviously wanted to ensure that they had their fair share of taxation from the digital services point of view, uh, but also maybe get their fair share of investment from these companies as well. Honor, over to you. What's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I just find even this conversation is fascinating because I, sometimes I feel like, you know, our organization and others have been working on, you know, tax as a, as a justice issue for, for decades. And I, I sometimes feel listening to the debate happening in Ireland is almost like mm. talking about gun control in the United States. There's just this kind of refusal to consider it from the bigger picture perspective. So um, one of my, my colleagues, uh, former colleagues, Dr. Matty Cahonan, who was in LSE and, and based in London, they led a bunch of um, economic re uh, research to try and estimate what was lost. And the, the final figure they came out with was that poorer developing countries lose about 400 billion US dollars a year as a result of avoidance schemes by large multinational companies and also extremely wealthy individual, or individuals. Now, as Aidan will tell you as well, the, the data is really, really messy. A lot of it isn't public, so these are estimates, but it gives you a picture of you know, the direction of travel and, and the scale of what we're talking about. And then as a, a development organization, for by contrast, that's more than twice what is given every year in official overseas aid for the entire world. So you have this sort of weird um, contrast, almost a robbing Peter to pay Paul type situation. But And it's in Ireland's case, it is a contrast between our hard won and well-earned reputation on human rights, multilateralism, equitable development on the one hand, and then our undeniably central role in facilitating schemes like the double Irish that Aidan talked about. Um, and similarly, you look at the reaction to the OECD process. I mean, the papers were covered in stories about Ireland's success. I, I don't really think there is a serious attempt to interrogate the bounds of that success. So in, in that particular instance, our success was essentially in driving the rate down as low as possible. We were the guy or one of a small number of people in the room trying to make sure that the, the limited number of huge companies that the, the deal will apply to will pay as low as possible. 
I think the average um, corporate income tax rate was closer to 21, 25%. So we have replaced a global race to the bottom with a sort of global race to the minimum. And I, I think what needs to change in it is some sort of a recognition or a serious recognition of the fact that um, schemes like the double Irish or the single malt that replaced it, what they do is that they siphon revenue away not just from France and Germany, but also from some of the poorest countries in the world. And we take a slice of it and then it heads off to Bermuda or the Caymans, or in many instances, it heads off to the bank accounts of some of the biggest and most profitable companies in the world. And I, I laughed, I, there was a, a really good um, Irish Times podcast, I think it was Hugh Linden with Noam Chomsky. I think he, is, he, he, he was speaking as well, and he, a really wide ranging, but he was asked about this and it was put to him that look, you know, it is a tough world. It's competitive. It's dog eat dog. Everybody wants a slice of this and it's me or the other guy. And he kind of chuckled and he said, well, that was also the worldview of Attila the Hun. And I, I mean, I, I think he was only being semi-serious, but there is a point there because that sort of um, it's us and them mentality. That's the opposite of the message that Ireland gives on its foreign policy and so many other issues. We, we are always the ones who are trying to emphasize the, to, to our credit, the value of multilateralism and a coordinated approach. If, if, if everybody goes into their own retrenches to their own interests on climate change, we won't do it. It's a global problem. If everybody just in, looks after themselves on, on vaccine equality, it, we won't do it. It's a global problem. Tax is the same. And it, it's one of those areas where I think we still haven't joined the dots between a kind of a shorter term, arguably ferric victory on facilitating these schemes and the, the impact that it is having. I, I've seen it in some of the, the poorest countries in the world. And what, what's happening in the, in the OECD, I think Aidan got it spot on when he said that all of the focus here and, and Shona as well on how it's perceived in Brussels, the 12.5% the rate took on this kind of totemic importance. Mm. It, it, was, it was a symbol, but really the biggest egregious um, avoidance scandals that happened here, the stuff that ends up on the front of the New York Times, the, the double Irish and so on, that wasn't really about the statutory rate. It was about the series, series of allowances and breaks on intellectual property and other things that enabled the effective rate pay to be many, many, many points lower than that. And that side of the, the deal, the pillar one, the whole scope of who gets what and when is still going to be thrashed out in, in Paris. And it is somewhere where I, I think eventually Ireland is going to have to reckon with the fact that the rest of the world isn't really going to accept for too long, I don't think, a kind of a beggar thy neighbor approach. It doesn't make sense. And even though we would and other development organizations would be highly critical of the draft text of the OECD or what we have so far in terms of how it reflects the interests of, of bigger countries and so on. But at the same time, it has won an important principle in that it, it, is, it is recognizing that the, the race to the bottom has to hit its base. It can't get any lower than this. And similarly, the work to try and better align taxable profits to real economic activity, where the work is done, where the sales are made, where the products are produced, um, and not just where the IP is housed is, is going to happen. The chances are like a lot of this stuff, the reform is going to be really, really modest and incremental. It won't meet the standards of justice set by all the usual suspects, but I think it was a kind of a, hopefully will be a turning of a tide moment. And if, if people, um, I think it, as a country, if, if we, even if you do take that sort of self-interested position of how much can we get out of this, you have to recognize the tide turning and saying, okay, we have made this money and these resources. What are we going to invest it in? If uh, you said, it, what was the term shown of the kind of comparative advantage argument? And I've heard officials say that a lot as well. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. So you have to say, well, can we develop a comparative advantage um, beyond the sort of um, tax games that have been rightly criticized for a number of years. I think it's going to have to change one way or the other and we'd be better off kind of getting out in front of it. Where can we well, invest I mean, that We've money? had a long time because we've been having yeah. this conversation for you know well over a decade. And I actually think the Irish government did hide behind multilateralism actually, because when it was, uh, when, when the conversation was being had in Brussels, consistently whether it was Michael Noonan or Pascal Dunner and so on would say well we'll have to wait to the, what the OECD says because yeah. we can't ask first as the European Union because you know then the US will just 
even though it has a much higher corporate tax rate, we, we need to act in unison. And for several years, it was waiting for the what the OECD wanted to say. And then reluctantly, it still did pass it. But I hope you're right about the tide being turning. But, but if you look at the fact that they the government fought so hard to ensure yeah. that 15% was all that they had to move towards, it'll be a long time before they shift again and i agree with you fully on the debate in ireland because even when i was listening to radio programs and so on the context was very much how much is it going to cost us and that's look, that's reasonable because obviously everyone has to worry about the exchequer but nowhere was there not well not as much anyway was there like but the game is sort of up for this and let's try to have another comparative advantage as well as having you know a reasonable tax offering i mean ireland is still very low but the, the problem for Ireland is just how structurally dependent it is on these companies. Mm. That's that's the real issue here. So yeah. you know, the Irish state, as much as I may normatively disagree with them, and I would agree with Connor in terms of his perspective on global tax justice here, there's just they just benefit too much from it. 20% of total revenue in Ireland comes from the corporate tax sector. That's excluding the amount of personal income that comes from the higher paid professionals that work in these sectors even though it only contributes let's say 5 10 to 20 let's say indirectly 20 percent of employment it's so this is the real problem i think for ireland how does it wean itself off that drug effectively and how does it generate an alternative growth model because i just don't see that at the moment and until that happens we can probably expect the media you know to continue to frame this issue in a totally self-interested this is about ireland being this is about defending us and even the language that's used here and actually i ran a survey experiment with a colleague of mine a couple of years ago where we tried to assess whether how media framing of corporate tax impacts public opinion and we found very clearly how the irish media frames public or the corporate tax issue was totally about ireland Inc. it's about nationalism it's about our self-interest it's about those people trying to take our money Whereas every other country that is framed much more on the basis of morality and fairness and tax justice. And you can see that very clearly. So Ireland really is the not just Ireland, but other small states and you know, low tax and jurisdictions and tax havens, the spectrum between the two really benefit from this. So the state itself is complicit in these global tax games. And I think that's the real political issue. The man in Brussels is after our tax, basically. Yeah, no, look, I mean, Shona, you know yourself and the same for myself working in comms at the IEA, you know, whenever you try and sell some of the European issues, it's always tax or Brexit. And um, those are the two games in towns over the last 10 years. Um, I, I do want to jump on just to some questions. There's some questions coming in from the audience. I mean, we, we, we could sit here all day uh, talking about tax and it was absolutely fascinating to hear your insights there. Um, the question here is it's directed at you, Connor, but I think everyone on the panel might have something to add on it. Sure. From Ross Patrick. Um, the UK government is set to introduce reforms to the Human Rights Act, which many human rights lawyers have criticised as being fueled by political rhetoric rather than necessity. Uh, does Connor see this as part of the broader international pushback against fundamental human rights norms, as we've seen in Hungary and Poland, for example? And if so, how should the EU grow, uh, respond to this growing international coalition of illiberal states? Uh, Connor, to you first on that, and then other panellists chime in. Yeah, I think that that is listening to some colleagues in the UK and some legal scholars who just, you know, can't believe that it's it's almost a misnomer to talk about an amendment to the Human Rights Act. It's one of the first times that you're going to have a, a, a parliamentary motion like that that will retrench and strip people of their rights. And it's it, it's it's hard to say whether it's it's part of that kind of bigger trend. There's a part of me that thinks that it's it's uniquely British, that it's kind of an extension to the bigger cultural debate that has kind of taken off in the UK over the last, I don't know, 10 years, maybe Brexit is a touch point on that, the, the sort of cultural divide on, on, on different issues. Um, I, I think it's kind of been reflected in what the British government are doing at the moment. Um, the, 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 the man, they have managed to paint a lot of the human rights protections in both British and European law as some sort of an infringement on people rather than the, the kind of thing, the bulwark against some of the excesses of precisely those same governments. Um, and I think it's it's remarkable and it's grim to see um, how far it's gone. Another One of the things that we've look, witnessed in our work around the world is this sort of rise of a liberal politics. The previous Israeli government under Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and it has been kind of jarring to see alliances strike up, you know, like the 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 kind of camaraderie between Bibi Netanyahu and um, Viktor Orban, 
despite the fact that you would assume, given the his party's position, um, they shouldn't have been natural bedfellows, but they were. And they you you saw people like that around the country uniting around this um, imagined uh, common enemy. I, I hope that there is a, I, I, I hope and I think that there is a significant kind of counter measure or, or a counter movement springing up though. Um, I, I think sometimes the, the rise of, of the right and this retrenchment of human rights around the world can be a little bit overplayed. And I think that there is just as big and vibrant a movement, again, driven by young people who are drawing the link between climate justice, who are talking about racial justice in the United States and around the world, who are kind of refusing to accept um, this slide. And I, I certainly hope that, that that side of the ledger wins out. But it's, it's, it's hard to see what's, what's happening in, in the UK and the fact that a lot of the measures that are being taken are often in, in response to totally imaginary threats and being really mm -hmm. misrepresenting the purpose of human rights law and the protections are, that are there. Shona, I mean, we, we had Frank Clark, former Chief Justice, speak to us recently, and he was talking broadly about rule of law is issues. But I mean, the UK came up and sort of these 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 repeals of laws and 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 what's what their what their motivations mm. were. And you know, he was he was aghast, and he sort of said, you know, nobody's really talking about this in the same way as they were about Hungary and Poland. What's what's your own sense? Well, I I mean, this is this is a bit like Brexit in a way because you've had a series of uh, British politicians for many years raiding against the European Convention on Human Rights. Theresa May, when she's Home Secretary, she was trying to have the UK remove themselves from it, even though. They were still in the EU. She was a Remainer and it's prerequisite to be in the European Convention to be a member of the European Union. And she had conjured up this problem, which was that they were trying to um, extradite a Jordanian um, man to Jordan for um, for trial. And the problem was that uh, he would breach his right to fair trial because some of the evidence used against him was obtained through torture. Anyway, in the end, all they had to do was negotiate with the Jordanian government and, and the Jordanians gave a commitment under the European Convention that the evidence, uh, that evidence would be omitted from the trial, the one that was obtained through torture. And then the situation was sorted. But Theresa May saw this as sort of um, an obstacle to her role as, you know, Home Secretary, which it wasn't. It was just a provision. The, you know, the inderogable right to a fair trial that everybody has regardless whether you're in the European Convention or not. This has continued for many years. But the thing about uh, the Human Rights Act, um, which is interpretation of the European Convention, is that the European Convention of Human Rights is littered through the Good Friday Agreement. Adherence to is it. And it's also in the Brexit negotiations, the withdrawal agreement. So you're, it's a whole new uh, problem that will emerge then. But similarly, when you look at the debate, I mean, I saw Dominic Raab recently saying that they'd have their own new Bill of Rights, a British one. Hello, it was British MPs that wrote the Convention on Human Rights. I mean, he is just a secretary, you should know that. But he said he protect quintessentially British rights, such as the right to protest and so on, which they're also trying to undermine. I mean, that it's it's so nonsensical and so illiterate, you know, uh, and so and therefore so dangerous because it's so populist and simplistic that Frank Clark is right. We should, this discussion needs to be had because if you see the rolling back of rights the way it is and the, the speed with which it's being done in the UK with Priti Patel when it comes to refugees breaching again the refugee convention and um, you don't know where it's going to end particularly if the Tories remain in government for the next few years and we don't see Keir Starmer who's a lawyer himself uh, defending or trying to parry this at all it's extremely worrying and the uh, as I said the implications for the Good Friday Agreement are also uh, quite important. Yeah, Aidan, anything to add on this? No, no, other, other, Connor and Sean have summed it up well. If we start talking about the Tory party now, we could be here for another hour. So. <laughs> one, one, one thing that Shona said there that stuck out to me is that, that that's a really good point on this idea of the retrenchment of human rights, because sometimes there can be a tendency in the, the Western world and the human rights community to kind of consider these things as set and settled, you know, that it's just this line of progress and that you're always going to go in one direction. But the idea that you can you can spend a long time trying to win protections or freedoms or rights that can be rolled back, um, I, I think in the United States, like if you contrast in Ireland, where you had this decades of campaigning around the Eighth Amendment and, and reproductive rights, and it was always compared to the United States. And then over there, over the last year, as far as I can see, there's been this really strong and serious attack on Roe versus Wade. And there is the potential that 
that right that mm. was hard won could grow back. I think it's a good reminder that all of the things that you know that we have won and value, whether it's workers' rights, whether it's LGBT rights, whether it's it's women's rights or reproductive health or whatever, you can never just go, okay, well that's bank now, and we'll move on to the next thing. You always have to be willing to defend it, and you're never going to get a, a press pause in time moment. No, but we all thought that certain things were settled, you know, the right to a fair trial and so on. But if you look at um, the border between, you know, uh, in, in the UK, where you see migrants and refugees trying to come through, you see yeah. people with waving Union Jack flags saying the UK needs to leave the 1951 Refugee Convention. So what? So they can legally send people back to their death. You know, I mean, these are basic provisions to allow people claim asylum like every single person in the world is allowed to do and this is where we're at in the UK it's extremely worrying and again I suppose with Covid and with Brexit and triumphalism and so on the debate isn't being had about how about the impact of this because it's always going to be um, minorities and people who are just different that are going to be impacted as opposed to I suppose original British nationals or white British nationals and so on. Yeah, um, one final question, I suppose we're going back to the start, we're going back to Germany, it comes from Alexander Conway, and uh, it's not to anybody in particular, so so feel free to chime in, it's regarding Germany's worsening relations with Russia, um, and specifically then what are the consequences for sort of a deteriorating German-Russian relationship for Europe, um, the suspension or delay of the Nord Stream pipeline, etc. You know, decision to expel two Russian diplomats. He just, he just wonders, um, is, is that something that's going to heat up in 2022? And is it something that we can see uh, having an effect now in the post-Merkel post -Merkel era? Um, Sean, I might start with you on that. Well, that's really the topic of debate today and tomorrow at the European Council. And don't think it's not really just a German-Russia issue. It's obviously a European Union. It's a NATO issue because there are fears you know, that Russia is about to invade Ukraine. There's 190,000 combat-ready troops on the border. Uh, NATO is unlikely to come to the rescue of Ukraine. We saw that in 2014. We saw this year what happened in Afghanistan and like and uh, the failure moral failure, military failure of the world to protect those people. Now they're under the under the leadership of the Taliban and suffering greatly. So we don't have any hope really that Europe or NATO is going to come to the rescue of Ukraine. So it's really down to negotiation and what the EU is going to do, and it'll be discussed today and tomorrow, is the, the depth and the length of the sanctions that will apply to Russia if they were to do that. Now, Mario Draghi, the um, the Italian leader said today that he doesn't believe that Putin is about to do that. He said he's spoken to Putin over the past few days and that he wants engagement and he wants assurances that there won't be any Eastern spread of NATO. Um, but it's still a very worrying thing. And the Nord Stream 2, that is left open. I mean, it's a red, the, the pipeline itself is ready to go. As we know, it bypasses Ukraine, Poland, goes from um, Russia directly to Germany. But there's obviously a very important discussion to be had about any European member state relying so much on energy. Uh, especially gas uh, from Russia. So that's it's, it's been put off at the moment for, for bureaucratic reasons, but it's, it really is the question of 2022 at the moment, aside from the obvious COVID, which you actually haven't discussed tonight, which is... Have a touch nice. of the ball, I know, I know. <laughs> COVID-free hour. keep it going. Um, yeah. yeah so. Aidan, anything on, on, on Russia, Germany, or EU, Germany more widely? Again, if I start talking about Russian nationalism and Putin, a bit like the Tory party, we could be here for a while. I would just, I would just repeat the, the last thing again. I mean, it, it, the structural dependence that the EU has, that Germany has on imported gas from Russia is crucial here. And you can see, and it's related to our, our second topic on, on, on climate justice, et cetera, and kind of financing the transition and how do you generate popular support and political will to make that transition. You know, it's going to be very difficult if you're, you're relying upon somebody like Putin and Russia to fundamentally generate the energy that's necessary to power your electricity. And, you know, the price effect, et cetera, that happened, et cetera, that, not that I'm saying, I think it's probably fair to say that the geopolitics between Russia and the EU had some role to play in terms of constraining supply and the import of gas and how that was impacting prices and the disruption, because we can see very clearly whether it's house prices, whether it's electricity prices, if prices start going up for those who can't afford to pay it, you're gonna get a political backlash. It's oh, amazing you say that, Aiden, because like I, I sometimes the chips just fall in a very unusual way. And now you've got this situation where something could possibly unite Greenpeace and Greta Thunberg. 
and the the fiscal inter or the interventionist right in the EPP, where they basically all say it is madness to be relying on this oil and gas. And maybe for very, very different reasons, this is the kind of thing that's going to push to a, a greater investment in, in yeah. renewable energy in, in the European Union, but yeah. from a very different base. It doesn't matter about motivation, though. If it happens, you know, all the greater good, I suppose. Absolutely. Look, we've come to the end of the hour, and, and that just leaves me to thank you on behalf of the people watching in for your for your insights. I think we covered a, a range of topics. Uh, I found the discussion fascinating, so so we could have gone on for another hour or two. Um, but but thanks very much, and that just leaves me to, to, to wish everybody watching um, a happy Christmas, and, and hope you have a good Christmas break, and, and, and same to all of our panelists. So thanks again for joining us, happy and, and look forward thanks, to chatting to you in 2022. Happy Christmas. Cheers, See you, Connor. Happy Take Christmas, care. guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.